Um, thank you everyone for coming and uh, for those of you who are watching um, after the event and just to say that we're so happy to have uh, the team the team from um, Elizabeth a Portrait in Parts here with us this evening, the post-production team, especially Joanna Quickmay who was the editor and uh, Kevin Loder who's the producer and um, we're lucky enough also to have the archive producers Emily Thomas, um, Rebecca O'Connor Thompson and Stuart Chambers and um, uh, as some of us know, or most of us probably know, um, the director Roger Mitchell passed away um, during the edit, which is, must have been a, a, a horrible shock for everyone. And um, so it, it's obviously, you know, amazing to, to know that you were able to finish the film and, and how you managed to do that in, with, without Roger there. And uh, the film on the whole is a celebration of the Queen's life and Joanna's uh, in archive and um, Joanna's history, some of which I know is uh, um, that she did work with Roger on Tea with Dames and uh, BAFTA nominated films, um, Alan Bennett's Diaries and Arena, the National Theatre. And Kevin, who we're lucky enough to have here as well, and who's going to lead the conversation, um, works on over 10 films with Roger, um, including, including Venus, um, Louis Weekend, and My Cousin Rachel. And, um, and also produced, um, among other things, of course, uh, The Lady in the Van and Nowhere Boy. And, um, and I'll let everyone else uh, speak for themselves when, when they want to. So I'll leave you to it. And um, we'll collect some questions in uh, the chat and ask them a bit later and people can come off mute and, and say hi, if that's okay. So take it away, Kevin. Oh, right, okay. Uh, <laughs> good evening, everyone. Um, <coughs> Well, uh, I don't quite know where to start, really. I mean, this was um, this was a kind of lockdown-initiated project in many ways because uh, Roger and I have, uh, as you said, worked on uh, several feature films and a couple of bits of television together. Our, our first show together was Buddha of Suburbia back in 1993, now available on iPlayer near you. Um, and... Obviously, we were working on a couple of, uh, you know, scripted features, um, but the lockdown made those look a little distant. And Roger could be quite impatient at times if he wasn't working. So, you know, he was ringing me up and going, what are we going to do? We've got to find something to do. And he was very keen on the idea of doing uh, an archive-based documentary. And... I think in our very first conversation, he mentioned that he was quite interested in doing it on the Queen. But I have to say, I thought that was kind of mad because I just thought, what else is there possibly to say? But anyway, we we agreed that we would come up with lists of potential candidates for archive documentaries. So he, he put the Queen at number one. And then we kind of kicked through a list of other ridiculous ideas, none of which really held water. Um, in quite the same way, because I think the thing about doing The Queen was you knew you weren't going to be short of archive. Um, so that was both the blessing and the curse of this project. Um, and the real question about it, uh, which Roger was always very, very clear sighted about, was what tonally the film was going to be. And, you know, very early on, he kind of wrote a little manifesto which he presented to me and to Joanna um which was you know effectively it was going to be a film that was a celebration but it was also going to have a bit of mischief and a bit of wit and it was going to not just include archive of the royal family and the queen but it was going to sprout off in many directions into you know, the times in which they lived, uh, the sort of weird connections that you could make between the Queen and Cleopatra or the Mona Lisa or, you know, whatever it was. It was going to be pretty unruly in its kind of um, intentions. But at its heart, it was going to remain something that was, you know, both affectionate about the Queen as an individual and slightly in awe of her, and that was the word Roger used, um, professionally. 
as you know this woman who'd done this job she didn't expect for over 70 years and and you know with one or two exceptions noted in the film barely put a foot wrong and so he wrote this little page and a half manifesto which we went then then went to market with i suppose um and this was when would this have been joanna i'm trying to think this was sort of autumn 2020 wasn't it well it was midway through the lockdown midway through the lockdown it? yeah so actually it's a bit earlier than that probably it was probably summer 20 wasn't it yeah, we were yeah. first discussing yes. it. It would have been summer. Yeah, yeah, summer 2020. So we were in the middle of the first lockdown, really. Uh, so that's when we we're discussing it, and you know, the notion of the jubilee even seemed a long way off then. Um, yeah. And I think by the autumn we'd started, we'd raised our finance effectively. So we kind of just begun, didn't we? You know, with you working in your cutting room, uh, <laughs> as ranged <laughs> behind you. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, you know, clearly the first and biggest challenge really was to assemble as much stuff to view as possible. Um, and so Emily and Rebecca are wonderful archive producers, both of whom, as they will tell you, have a little experience in um, some royal themes and documentaries in the past. So they had a pretty good idea of where things might be. And I guess, you know, we all started by watching the previous documentary series, you know, Elizabeth R. and, um, you know, John Brinkett's film about the working monarchy. Um, and, you know, the things that have kind of already pulled a lot together or, or had had special access from behind, you know, from Buckingham Palace to go behind the scenes to the Queen. So that was sort of our starting point. And then we branched out from there, really. So the biggest challenge to start with was just to try and coordinate the massive trawl of archive that was going on with Rebecca and Emily, actually getting it to Joanna and Roger, who were sitting in the cutting room, uh, with the good offices of Stuart, who was in Bristol. And so archive was kind of whizzing up and down the M4 corridor on drives a bit. Um, and being whizzed around on links a bit. Um, and I suppose, you know, as we started to view the idea of, uh, well, the, the, the film had always been predicated on the idea of chapter headings and thematic kind of groupings of material, which wouldn't be chronological because the, the Rogers basic idea was that the film would be relentlessly anti-chronological. Uh, it would not have any commentary it would not uh, have any specially shot talking heads. The only talking heads there are are, are from archive. And that it would not be mediated in any way. Uh, and so it really would be archive and music um, in a delicious combination arranged in chapter headings, which we didn't really know what they were going to be at the beginning. Um, but adding up to hopefully a hill of beans and a journey that took you through the life the times, the thematics, the ideas around the monarchy and the kind of ideas around the personage of the Queen, I suppose. So, yeah. Joanna, what do you remember of your first um, your first conversations with Roger about it? My, my first conversations with Roger were um, probably just pure terror. <laughs> uh, because it seems so huge. I don't know what Emily and Rebecca think, but because um, Roger's idea was everything, of, as, as you said, Kevin, it was never going to be a chronology. It was never going to be a story of her life. Uh, so Roger's idea was much more that it would be about ideas around the Queen. And he had some ideas that he thought were interesting. So he had that idea, for instance, of the Mona Lisa, that the Queen was unknowable. Um, so that was a idea right from the start. Um, I'm trying to think what the other initial, and I've actually, I've got, I've got, uh, I've got a few, a few of our Roger's notes here. Um, 
there was one of these early ones. There were sort of obvious, there were sort of ones that Roger was interested in right from the beginning. I suppose ships, definitely. So the image that you have there of the Queen on, on the, um, it's, it's, I can't remember, that's on the South Africa tour, isn't it, Emily? Yeah. Right. Oh, that ship. Um, so that was that was clearly a standout right from the beginning. So then there was obviously going to be something about ships right from the beginning. And that was the first sequence that I cut um, because that was such a standout. That, that footage that you see there um, of her playing with the sailors on the ship uh, was clearly so... Uh, that you know that was clearly going to go in so that was a first thing that we cut um but um it was just huge i think was the thing so it was just about staying calm uh which roger was extremely good at and um just seeing i mean emily and rebecca i'm sure you want to say something about this first uh, how we started um, well, well, initially, I mean, you, you, st we started, and then you're, you're in the edit, and you don't have anything to look at or cut with initially. So then I, I sort of just, I thought, well, how do we, how do we tackle this monster? Um, so we sort of went and do different tacks, and it obviously the film wasn't chronological at all, but we did um, a sort of a chronology of going through the her life from with using sort of AP and Getty getting all stuff that was digitized that hadn't been had he was still on film so we got a lot of that stuff but so I was just sending you year by year by year but then we would also have the thematic stuff um where and the requests where Roger would have ideas and you would have ideas Joanna um where you'd write and we'd have a request list when we'd then run around and try and find what is the best footage of showing the Mona Lisa and what are the best documentaries of that? And so then we'd go down that angle, and like, and then eventually we 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 hopefully found the really great stuff that worked. But initially, it was like we've got to get you some stuff, we've got to get you some material to work with, wasn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, you did the bulk of it, Em, because Em started a bit before me. Emily did the Queen's Life from AP and Getty, basically. But yeah, the so other thing that was fun is we we did get to go off piece a bit as well, because Roger, mm -hmm. you know. We did what we tell all editors never to do, but we went on YouTube quite a lot and we found really fun bits, some UGC. So for archive producers, we obviously had a brief, but we were able to play around a bit and we used to send Roger emails going, what do you think of this? And he'd say, love it, hate it, love it, hate it, basically. So it was really good fun. Not yeah, it, it was definitely, Kevin, wasn't it right from the start? It was anything. It could be anything. It didn't matter... No, it didn't matter where it was from, whether it's professional or not, private or not. Um, and in fact, at the very beginning, we we spent quite a bit of time trying to find out if people had stuff in their attics. And, you know, we posted and put out the word, you know, with the Daily Mail and everyone else to say, you know, if you've got some footage of the Queen coming to your WI or factory or whatever it is, you know, please can we have it? And, and we we had high hopes at the beginning that would yield something, but actually it hardly yielded anything at all, apart from a few mad royal collectors who had kind of, you know, endless tea towel and mug collections that they wanted us to photograph. Um, so we kind of realised, actually, and it's partly just the sign of the times, I suppose, you know, there wasn't the democratisation that's possible now that everyone's got an iPhone. You know, people didn't, on the whole if they were near enough to the Queen, have the means of recording her <laughs> to hand, whereas, of course, yeah. now everybody does. Um, and also, I think probably the protocols of security have changed a bit on that front as well. Um, so that didn't really yield anything. But as Rebecca says, you know, we were looking everywhere on the Internet. I suppose the sort of unique thing about this project in a way was how we how collaborative it was on a weekly basis because it was mm -hmm. ever evolving. And so we had a Thursday morning meeting with all of us every Thursday where, you know, Roger and Joanna say, OK, well, we've cut quite a lot of stuff with horses now, but we could do with a bit more around, you know, her as a child with a horse or her, you know, going to the horse races or whatever it was. 
And so as the thing started to, as the universe started to cool, you know, and the planets became a bit clearer, then we could go back to Rebecca and Emily and, and be a bit more precise in the kind of things we were looking for, um, which kind of made their job just about manageable um, until the next curveball came along or, you know, <laughs> Next impossible request for uh, clearing, you know, a section of a feature film with murky rights and, um, <laughs> or, you know, Elizabeth Burton, Elizabeth Taylor as Cleopatra or whatever it was. So, I mean, you know, the, the, the range of archive did go from YouTube to Hollywood movies, which also, you know, was a clearance challenge and a, and a financial one on occasion. <laughs> So yeah, I think it was the, the, the it was that aspect of kind of constant evolution and teamwork that that made it pretty unique in that way. Mm. Normally, with documentary, you go and shoot stuff, and then you may be adding in archive, but you've got this kind of backbone of what you've shot. Whereas because we didn't shoot anything, you know, we didn't have that that vertebra down the middle of the thing. So we were we were having to kind of constantly involve the chapters. And I mean, chapters came in and out, didn't they, Joanna? There were chapters yeah, that were started yeah. and abandoned. I've there were chapters good... that were popular and then not so popular. The, these are the chapters. And there we go. That, that, that's all the chapters. And, and we laid them out on my tea tray. And um, and we shuffled them around on the, on the tray. But I don't know how many are here. There's probably tw 20 there. Um, because yeah. some of the some of the chapters were sort of ideas that Roger had right from the start, but some of the chapters came out of what Emily and Rebecca were sending us. So we, uh, Roger and I, watched everything in the chronology that Emily and Rebecca sent, and about ninety nine percent of it was really really dull. And it was just the queen walks to podium, queen stands on podium, queen takes flowers, queen leaves, most of it. Um, but obviously through this amazing amount of time, uh, which was interesting, I mean, it was fantastic for us that she lived so long um, because there's interest just in that. Um, but um, then, but from that, watching all that stuff, like suddenly something would, suddenly we'd spot something that was a bit more, you know, grabbed us. And then, so I'd kind of then categorize that. Um, so I had, I don't know, on this, on this project, maybe 70 bins or something that I'd decide that things in different categories could go in, that, in those bins. I'm trying to find well this there this is quite a fun one because this was this just says our house madness this one mm -hmm. um because there was that fantastic concert that um emily and rebecca sent us um where suddenly they we saw madness on buckingham palace so on that kind of that grew on the roof yeah that, that grew purely from that event to then see all the palaces and then to see people going to the palace and so it would kind of in the loveliest editing way uh, organically most of the scenes were just clumps that organically clumped together um, which was was really really nice because we weren't trying to tell a story I mean I think Roger always felt that the the story of the Queen we actually we all know because it's the story of all of our lives um there's virtually nobody alive I think I mean there might be just but there was virtually nobody alive who she wouldn't have been able to tell the story of their own lives so uh there was nothing we had to tell we didn't have to you know that was for me coming from a documentary background there was that was incredibly freeing because there was nothing we had to explain at all and Roger was really not interested in that at all um which I think was it was really important I thought that he came from a film and theatre background um 
because actually that his theatre background, I don't know what you think, Kevin, but I think that was key to his view for the film because it was all about the theatre of royalty. You know, that was a real, real key. Yeah. Um, certainly, well, the film starts, doesn't it, with the beginners, you know, with the, with the notion that, you know, beginners to the stage, please. You know, the show's about to begin. And a definite sense that the Queen is on stage most of the time. And so, you know, the trick of the uh, the trick of any investigation into her is to try and compare what she's like on stage with the tiny glimpses you get of her off stage. Um, and as we know, those glimpses have been pretty rare over the years. But one of the things we could do in this film, I suppose, was to concentrate those a bit. Um, and so I think that's one of the ways the film works on you. I mean, to, to think about the whole life thing, I mean, a very early idea, I think, in Roger's pitch document was that we would see her shaking hands with, mm -hmm. you know, 10 prime ministers or six popes or whatever it was, because, you know, we had this notion that she was the still point of the centre of everything and, you know, history world around her. And although we didn't keep those ideas as literally as they were in the manifesto, you can see in the finished film that, you know, bouquets and handshakes hmm. over the course of decades are one of the kind of ways in which the film gives you the sense of you know the swirl of time around this woman as she gets older and you know and and more gray and and you know more used to doing her job um so that you know there was an inherent kind of um element of emotion in that i think yeah um, I mean, just, just in case I forget to say this, um, I just wanted to say one thing, which is Roger did finish the edit. Um, yes, uh, no, he did. He it was. Yeah. We were in the final mix. In fact, we finished the final mix. He gave his final notes to the final mix, and then went home, and then never came back. Very sadly. Yeah. Um, but you know, we were thankfully done because if we had not been done, it would have been pretty awful to contemplate yeah. actually yeah yeah I mean I'm sure we would have tried to finish it Joanna but it, it you know it wouldn't have been it would have been pretty pretty weird and thank god we didn't have to face no, that thank god we didn't have to we we were we were pretty well advanced I mean you know I, uh, I you know I went I thought this is going to be a great lockdown project for the producer. You know, I'm just going to sit at home, really. And then, you know, every week they're going to send me kind of more delicious cut footage and, you know, ask for a few <laughs> comments. And then, you know, another week will go by and they'll send me some different delicious cut footage. <laughs> didn't know, he didn't know he'd leave us with, you know, 1,200 clips to clear. <laughs> 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 it's obviously, you know, one of the... One of the less uh, fragrant and interesting aspects of all this in many ways was the, you know, the endless um, wrangle of clearances when you're, you're making a film with this much archive and this many kind of sensitive politically issues of where the archive comes from. But also, you know, we had to track down almost certainly in the celebrity world, everyone who appeared in it and ask them personally if they didn't mind. So it was it was quite a labour of clearance, wasn't it, Emily and Rebecca? It certainly was. It certainly was. I, it was I think, yeah. yeah. I, think I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff that in a regular production, it would just be we would have just not done. You know, like the um, not the Charge of the Light. Isn't the Charge of the Light Brigade that that yeah. scene? Waterloo, wasn't it? Waterloo, yes, Waterloo, yeah. yeah. That was. I mean, Nightmare that was like film. four <laughs> different studios, and then. Most film in Russia, and it wasn't. Ever, it wasn't really ever clear who owned half the who, right. I don't know. I mean, we did. We did our best, but most yeah. most productions that would have just. We would just wouldn't have. We would have lost it. It would not have ended up. But because it just made the film, didn't it? It was just so great. It was just yeah. worth pursuing it. So we went the extra mile to clear absolutely everything, and you know, making sure that people were cleared, like that lovely um, disabled child. Um, in oh, this the garden, party, yes. the garden yeah. party, yes, yeah, no, I mean, I thought it's really important that that she be cleared because 
you know, it's vulnerable, vulnerable young adult, but um, we, we managed to track her down, didn't we, Rebecca, eventually? She well, still... you found the obit of the husband. and then I, I did, did, yeah. That, we found that the wife ran a charity and I had a lovely chat with Denise Maybe She was a lovely yes. in the world, still around, and her daughter's still around as well. Yeah, so. they're still both still yeah. around and and obviously, and gave her consent, so that was great because that put my mind at rest, but the BBC also wanted us to clear yeah, we had to get I mean, partly that's because it was a theatrical film you know it was intended and sold as a theatrical documentary for worldwide cinema release so mm. you know we had to go through the kind of very strict clearance procedures that you would on any kind of movie destined for the international theatrical market so that raised the bar pretty high on paperwork unfortunately <laughs> it was quite a job but a great one really Fabulous, and I hope that I mean, some of it was it. easy, you know, because people like you know people like Harry Enfield or you know Dawn French or whatever it was, you know, actually between Roger and and me, you know, we could basically email quite a few of those people. You know, we knew how to get to them. Probably... And if we didn't know personally, we knew how to find someone who would get to them. So, and yeah. one of the kind of one of the kind of fun things about it along the way was that you know we had quite fun correspondences with. Um, with people like Harry Enfield. I mean, he he said he was very proud of that sketch that who does one think one is. But but he also said that, you know, they had David Williams standing on a box so that the height differential between <laughs> him and the Queen or Harry playing the Queen was even greater than it would have seemed. So, you know, you got little insights into some of the material that we were using as well, which was always fun. Mm -hmm. We should mention Stuart here because, um, you know, that the actual technological challenges of this were pretty immense, weren't they, Stuart? Because it was coming in from all different sorts of places, this archive, and some was digitized and some was not, and it was in different ratios and different formats and different states of definition. Yeah, and, um, I mean, it might be interesting for, for people watching this now or later, just to, to sort of understand what you had to kind of coordinate from where you were sitting on the project. Yeah, I didn't think I was going to have to coordinate quite as much as what landed. <laughs> None of us did, right. Stuart. But I, I think it was it was a good reflection of like the Queen and how, how long she's been around and how she's grown up and all of the formats that came with her. Um, and they reflected certain moments in her life. Um, and it was quite nice to see that remixed back up in the edit as well. But there were certainly huge amounts of formats, uh, the good, the bad and the ugly, because uh, like I said, a lot of it was like YouTube kind of material. So there was broken frame rates that we tried to repair. Uh, there's flicker and compression problems, which I've experienced quite a lot of um, in other archive projects. Um, and then D3 and DA88 tapes and yeah, all sorts were coming out of the woodwork. Um, but the, the girls made it as simple as possible and the paperwork and everything, it was, it was a massive effort uh, and it was, it was really well handled by the team. One thing that uh, Roger, I think from the beginning, was interested in each piece of archive uh, telling its own story as, a, as an artefact. Um, so other archive things I've done, you might be trying to smooth it out to make it look all of a piece. Uh, and this Roger was was absolutely definite that each each single clip should retain its original um, sort of imprint, if you like, of when it was made. So although I was putting every clip together, as if they were all equal. So I never worried whether something was coming, like when in time, like every clip I just put together, if it worked as two clips or four clips or eight clips together, but then each clip, then the job wasn't to then smooth it and make it look all of a piece. The job was, a, was a, always a patchwork quilt um so that was also what Stuart was doing as well was always making sure that the clips original you know if there were errors or whatever or weird things in the clip that actually you keep them um because uh they that they each clip had its own imprint of the of the time so 
or if it you know if it was a it could be, it well, we, could we, be we decided early on not to not to try and rationalize the ratios didn't we and just let yeah. the, the original ratios things were shot in kind of be be part of the experience of watching the film yeah which so there was got, some consternation about i remember from well a lot of consternation i think and yeah. um maybe, maybe it looks like it's all over the place because it is literally could be anything uh could be no, you know, i don't think that's the experience when you're watching it is it i mean well it, i hope it, not it becomes a, it becomes <laughs> a continuum pretty quickly i don't you know and i think that's right the different textures and definitions and colorings and you know and media of the film mm. the originals do actually present but um but i don't think they distract that was always the hope and i, I think that's how it does work yeah, well, I'd be interested to know from people because it, it is quite a an alien thing to do, I think, to totally yeah. just cut any clip to any clip. I mean, you could easily be going from a Hollywood movie to a YouTube clip. Well, a Samson corporate video. <laughs> Samson corporate video, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, is this a good place for us to open up to see if anyone has any questions? Because... Uh, yeah. Is there anything else and that anyone, any of you would like to add now, or should we have some questions and then come back to the team? Actually, I've got quite a good, sorry to interrupt you, but I've got quite, I've got a lovely quote that Roger came in with very early on. Um, I, can I hold it up? I don't know how to do it. I'm not very good with screens. Yeah. Can you read it? Making the it, fish. Yeah. Making the fish. Yeah. Can you read the well, quote? I'm not sure we can read the line under it, that. It says, yeah. anyone can turn a fish into fish soup, but it's much harder to turn fish soup into a fish. <laughs> <laughs> I thought was spot on. Roger found that uh, in a book really early on. And so I've had it next to me here in the edit uh, mm. ever since, because I thought that described really what we were trying to do with all these millions and millions of com almost completely random things to try and tell a story, but without having a story. Um, <laughs> yeah. it's really uh, just all based on ideas. Could you, um, it'd be great to know um, more about how you crafted it together with the music and, and how you, um, how you worked with Roger, you know, in terms of the the timings, you know, whether you were together the whole time or how it how it how you how you did it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was um, it was uh, very much we so we watched. We'd we'd usually spend two or three hours in the morning, most mornings, maybe three or four days a week, watching stuff together and talking, and then Roger would leave. And I'd have a look at what things I'd grouped together and what we'd talked about. And um, uh, usually in the afternoon and then probably the next day, I'd then assemble uh, either, um, well, for the, the, the boat thing was really easy because I just went, okay, that, well, this is clearly fantastic footage. So why don't I put together everything to do with boats um or I'm trying to or you know some something would oh I know so say in the archive we'd watch something uh where Marilyn Monroe met the Queen and so we'd have a conversation of like oh wow the Queen looks really glamorous I, I hadn't really taken in quite how glamorous she was um so then after Roger left oh so that so then we'd say oh th that's interesting maybe there's something there of, of how glamorous she was and actually she looks like a movie star. So then uh, I'd think, okay, well, I'll do something to do with movie stars. And um, and then I thought, or oh, maybe movie stars are to do with sort of your fantasies. Um, so maybe that's then about dreaming as well. So then we had people dreaming because Roger had had this idea early on I don't know where he got it, and I don't know if I believe it's in it. the manifesto that everyone's had a dream about the Queen. Yeah, yeah. I thought, well, I, I don't, I don't know if I buy that myself. 
but um, I like the idea that maybe dreaming would connect with these sort of movie stars and so then I put that together. Oh, and then then we found, or um, I don't know who found this, but there was um, Paul McCartney saying he used to fancy the Queen and he was a teenager dreaming about the Queen. Uh, so that all went in together. So it was it was very organic. Sorry to answer your question. It yeah, was... We were very lucky to find that footage of this other random little young boy dreaming, sleeping. Yeah. That rather did look like a young Paul McCartney. Yeah, <laughs> absolute fluke. Um, yeah. <laughs> very, I was like, we were wasn't even looking for it specifically because Roger hadn't didn't actually tell us that that's what he wanted. No, it that was that was I just spotted that. I can't remember. Yeah, I had it even. Yeah, he just asked for people for boys, young boys sleeping, the young boy dreaming, or looked like he. Was I don't think we asked for young boys. I think we just said. I think sleeping. About dreaming. Yeah, dreaming and sleeping. So then we sent him a bunch of stuff. And and yeah. then luckily that that worked beautifully, I thought, because it yeah. really could look like a, a sleeping Paul McCartney. So, so it I mean, was I... very organic. And then and then Roger would come back after a couple of days and I'd show him probably three little assemblies. And then he'd just respond. And he was, I think, as Emily and Rebecca said, he was, he was, you know, he would be like, yes, no, yes, no. You know, he was very quick and very mm. clear um so he'd you know sometimes he'd say I don't I don't get that what are you trying to do <laughs> and sometimes he'd go yes I love it that's that's fantastic do more of that um so he was just he was very open I would say to anything I could literally put together anything and he would respond to it um and if it was complete rubbish he'd just say no I don't really get it and then we'd forget about it. And if there was something, there was some seed in there, then he'd say, oh, well, I like that about it. And then I'd develop that. Um, so it was very much, I think Kevin said, you know, we were just finding our way as we went along. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I guess the other, I mean, the other kind of building block, I suppose, was music. So Ian Neal, who was our music supervisor and who Roger and I worked with a lot on feature films I mean we, very early on we got Ian to do a kind of huge kind of Spotify playlist of stuff and it wasn't everything that's in the film now because we all brought things to the table but it 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 started off the exploration of the music and so I guess you know quite early on Roger was selecting tracks of Joanna to to experiment cutting two um and because it's such a musically driven film in in many many respects you know that became kind of a key thing mm. and again you know terrible clearance challenges on some of that you know very early on you know roger i think even probably in the manifesto Joanna, he knew he wanted to have the beatles her majesty's pretty nice girl yeah and I remember saying on pretty much day one, you'll never get it. It's <laughs> never clear for feature films, you'll never get it. <laughs> anyway, what did I know? But, you know, it was a bit of a journey, some of that clearance stuff musically as well as archive-wise. I mean, um, one, of you, one of our um, participants here has just messaged me to ask us about the palace. So that's almost a session in itself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to to give you, I mean, and Rebecca and Emily are the, uh, you know, this is their, <laughs> this is their their uh, front line. They they know more about this than any of us. But um, as you've seen since the funeral, the palace try and be very um, possessive of any footage of the royal family that in their view is shot with special access or on royal premises. And, um, you know, there's been a bit of an uproar about their request since the funeral to ask the national broadcasters to restrict their all rights use to an hour of material, which effect gives, which in effect gives the palace editorial control over any reuse of material for the two weeks following the Queen's death beyond the hour that the broadcasters have to sort of say, we'll take this hour of stuff, thank you very much. 
after that, the palace is trying at the moment to insist that they go back and ask for permission to reuse anything else. I actually, because I'm working on something at the moment. Oh yeah, go on, <laughs> share. So my understanding is that it's the in, anything inside the abbey, and there may even be a point on the steps going into the abbey which you have to still, I physically would have to ask permission. So the street stuff at the moment, I think, is okay. Just to let you know, <laughs> it's you, the abbey you get, issue. You though. get the idea. Anything. The idea is that yeah. this is not just about footage that you know that there, there, there's two kinds of very um guarded footage of the royal family and one is what they call you know the personal archive which is the stuff that belongs to the royal household and includes kind of home movie footage and you know stuff that might have featured in the 1968 royal family film and so on that stuff is held at the bfi on the whole in the archive there but even to view it you have to get permission from the royal household and the royal household owns and controls the copyright of that footage so that's a very special category of stuff but in addition to that most of the people who have filmed behind the scenes at the palace so eddie mertzoff's elizabeth r uh, documentary series for example made by the bbc and for the bbc but everything that was filmed behind the scenes at the palace for that is under a reuse restriction so that although the BBC technically co own the footage with the palace, you can't reuse it without the palace's permission. Well, and, and I don't think Eddie even knew that, did he? The... No, I don't think anybody really knew that <clears throat> until we came along. And so, mm. so you know, we and it, and it is a bit Kremlin like, you know, you kind of go along and you have to deal with the Queen's communications team. The press secretary and you know and the first thing he said to Roger and Joanna and me was well the important thing for us is context you know we need to know exactly how you're going to use the footage and exactly in what context and so we said to him well that's going to be pretty difficult because we haven't a clue how we're going to use it you know we just know we need it and this is our overall kind of intention. This is our overall strategy. This is the film we're trying to make. But we cannot tell you right now what is going to be next to this bit of footage and what is going to precede it and succeed it and what bit of music is going to be playing underneath it. We just can't tell you that right now. So you're going to have to trust us with the stuff. We're going to have to go away and craft it and then we'll bring, bring it back and show it to you. And hopefully in the spirit, that you know we're talking about and in the spirit that you're allowing us to you know you're condoning the film in existing in some sense um we'll hope that you you feel able to um grant us permission but it was an elaborate dance and it went on for months and months and months and was shrouded in mystery because clearly there were other projects about to start because of the jubilee in in the kind of you know with the palace's cooperation and they wouldn't tell us what they were but we knew some of them were being discussed and so those were competing projects as far as they were concerned so the issue for the palace became partly context and then partly how much of our stuff are you using and is that going to spike our guns for our special you know behind the scenes films that we're trying to make for the jubilee None of which they ever told us out loud, but you know, uh, I think Rebecca and Emily kind of knew that was going on a bit as well. And so, in the end, we had to just make the film, and then Joanna and I had to take it in and show it to the communications team after we'd finished it. Um, and there was a bit of a wrangle about whether we could have, you know, more than twenty minutes of this designated special access footage that the household controlled or whether it had to be closer to 15 minutes and there, there were little bits of wrangles about it at the very end of the process and I think we did have to shed a couple of short clips that we we had in what would have been our final cut but they, they weren't particularly damaging in the end um and yeah we had to take the film into Buckingham Palace it was a very strange experience wasn't it <laughs> Watch it on the laptop with the, the police fun. communication secretary. It was quite fun once we actually got in to go to Buckingham Palace. It was just all the Kremlin stuff was was yeah. pretty weird, actually. Yeah. 
they kind of i think they said make you know use less of our stuff but they didn't want to say what they didn't want to say how much they didn't want to i don't know it was very hard to know what um the queen's communication secretary was press secretary was what battles he was having to fight but you know to his credit he kind of believed in roger's film and he kind of accepted our pitch which was this won't be like anything else your approach to do and it's going to go into cinemas in many countries so it's going to have a slightly different landing it's going to have a different cultural context than just another television film on the bbc or itv or channel five and you know to be fair to them they did kind of get that and i think because of that we were granted sort of pretty much kind of license that they wouldn't normally grant to to maybe some other filmmakers and they recognized that roger was a kind of significant british film director and therefore you know this was going to be something worth worth going along with if not actively backing <laughs> Would anyone else like to ask a question? Katrina, did that answer your question? You you'd messaged me about it. I don't know if you had anything specific you wanted to, to know. <laughs> yes, thanks. She's just messaged me back. So there we go. Um the, in, in terms of what the goal was broadly, uh knowing that everybody knows the story of the queen i mean was it a was was the ambition to shed light on the character or was it more of a more of a sort of i don't want to use the word collage that just sounds like the, the 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 wrong the wrong thing but but in in putting this many diverse clips together there's obviously an idea per section and that's the idea is the thing that takes everything you know takes everything with it you know, really, really well because it's a it's a wonderful thing. But did 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 the, the director have an idea of what he wanted to actually say, or was it all completely dependent on the material? It's not a manifesto. No, I think it's an exploration. I mean, it's an exploration of her and of our times. I think that was the intention. You know, that that it wasn't dogmatic. It was. I think Roger's idea was that, you know, you create a kind of constellation and within that constellation, you know, you travel through it and in traveling through it, you get to understand not only a bit more about who the queen may be, but a little bit more about who we are as a country and the times in which we've all grown up and lived. And, you know, I think that was really the intention. Um, and to just make you look at things in surprising and new and different ways you know and i mean it it's it's a pretty difficult bit of alchemy to describe isn't it and um i just know from the reaction of people who watched it that the film does exert this kind of rather amazing kind of power you know that it the the people really enjoy its wit and its kind of mischief but they're also very moved by it and they're very moved by it on many levels, not only because they're sort of moved by the person of the Queen and, you know, that life of service and all the stuff we've heard about at the funeral and over the last months, but they're moved about, you know, just seeing what's happened to us as a country and thinking about when we were young at the Silver Jubilee or whatever it was, you know, those of us who were at the Silver Jubilee when younger. Um you know, so it does feel like a portrait of the times and the country as well as of the Queen. Mm -hmm. But as I say, I don't know, Joanna, what you think, but I mean, I, I think thought it, was, it was, well, it, it, I thought it was also, who do we want the Queen to be? Yes, that's I good thought it was quite interesting. Like, it was all the things, there was a small amount of who she might actually be, but actually that was kind of minor, really. Um, I thought it was quite interesting as who who all are all the things we project onto the queen mm. uh, I think is what I found interesting um yeah. all those the different the the mother the universal mother the film star the you know all those this person wearing a crown 
Um, I, I like the, the the key thing that she said, which is the crown is a, is an idea, not a person. So for me, it was to do with the the idea of being queen, which I'd never seen before, and that, and that's what to me I I was trying to I think is unique. Yeah. Did, um, do, Joanna, did, did you ever see the trailer for The Shining that made it look like a romantic comedy? No, no, uh, I haven't. I've seen it, it's brilliant. I, I, <laughs> I, I was just wondering if that kind of idea was in your mind because was there any footage that you could cut together in such a way that, that would make her into a supervillain? I, I, I mean, were you ever tempted super to go? Supervillain? Well, not no. necessarily. Do, do you know what I mean? Just uh, not Not negatively, but... You know, there, there, there's a great deal of humour to 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 uh, to be mined from this kind of juxtaposition of, of material. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't think I saw her lose her temper. I mean, I watched many millions of hours of footage of her doing various things, and, and she never seemed to get fractious and cross. She, ne you never saw her sort of shouting at anybody well the, the, what, the only time emily was the time when um she was doing the uh photo call with annie Leibovitz. oh yes she was really grumpy and then there was that huge hoo-ha wasn't there because the, apparently it was her going in she was grumpy she didn't storm out that's why the whole no, no I, I mean I, I know yeah. the internet yeah. <laughs> but just interestingly yeah. I think maybe we don't want her to be a supervillain. We don't want her to be grumpy. I think it would have been, I, you could probably do it. Could you, do you think if you wanted to, if you tried hard enough, you could probably cut it. If, if you, you, you have like, enough, you have the right music, yeah, probably. Music. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 the fact that everyone says she never really smiles, but she actually does a lot. But you know, everyone kind of says, "Oh, how she!" So you could probably mm. just have all these stern faces all the time. <laughs> yeah. You probably have a better chance with His Majesty, I suspect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Let, let, let's let's wait a while before we. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, what else have I got? Well, I mean, the other the other person, the other great collaborator in this film that we haven't talked about, obviously, was George Fenton. So although we had a lot of, you know, needle drop um, music from George Formby to the Beatles to whatever, you know, Stormzy. But, you know, we did also have, I mean, there's 30 or 40 minutes of George's music in the film, um, which, you know, obviously was... George, George was watching early chapters as they came off the off off the, off the production line quite early on, wasn't he, Joanna? And I mean, you know, and responding yeah. to them. So, yeah, uh, he was yeah. involved very early. We just didn't, we didn't just present him with a finished film. He was he was there pretty much throughout as well. Yeah, and I I think he does that thing um, of of giving it some kind of unity. Yeah, because uh, mm -hmm. that was always my worry is that with such a disparity of footage and then using all the found music, which could be, you know, yeah. was found all over the place. But then you needed one element. Obviously, there was her. She was the one element. But then one thing to draw it and make it, you know, help yeah. us, to, uh, you know, with it, with these chapters being quite they could have been quite bitty um yeah. so i think that it really needed that score it needed to be scored as a whole no. uh unit and that's how george did i mean he was watching things but he didn't actually score it until it was all together which i think was really important because he quite often joins the chapters um yeah in a way and that they weren't joined before his score. I mean, there was there was a stage in the latter part of the edit where actually the chapters were pretty, were getting pretty ready, weren't they? But the order was still shifting about a bit. I mean, obviously the beginning was the beginning and the end was the end, but within that, you know, there's the there's the uh horribilist chapter. There was always that moment of where are we going to put that? Where are we going to put the the thing where all the bad stuff is and the burning of Windsor Castle and the 
things that have gone wrong for the royal family is over the years and the queen's response to some of those kind of missteps so that was always a kind of a, a pretty big structural decision in the film as to where that was going to go you got a question here about did he provide temp music but I think we had a scratch no. track, didn't we? we were, no, we he didn't. We did I, use some temp music, but George didn't provide it, did he? Yeah, no, I, I put in temp music, yeah. which actually George was was um, really pleased to use as a, a guide to feeling. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, I was surprised um, that he seemed to find that helpful. I don't want to speak for George. I should, we should have asked him to join us. But um, because, partly because he didn't write it until the very end, which I didn't fully understand until he'd done it, uh, actually, because I think he did want to see it as a whole film. So for a long time, we had temp music in uh, that was written by lots of different people that I just found myself. Um, so I was really interested to know how George would feel about that. Um, and actually it was, yeah, it was quite amazing. He, he said he'd used it quite closely, but I think cause he's such a brilliant composer, he didn't in any way obviously copy what was there, but he just, he definitely used it as a, as a guide. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just noticing the time it's, um, yeah. <laughs> it's half past thank you so much for giving us insight into such a beautiful film and uh i don't know i, I it was like being in um i don't know how to describe it like being in someone's mind that the whole thing was like it was like you were remembering things even though you had or had not seen them i don't know it was just a wonderful experience to watch so thank you and um are, are there any final questions uh, are everyone happy to stay on for a minute if there are are there any more questions? Would anyone like to unmute or everyone like to unmute? <laughs> Say yeah. thank you or anything. I, I, Sean. I'd just like to um, say I, I thank you. I think it's absolutely wonderful film. And I, I think you've all done a sort of amazing job. <laughs> it is a quite thrilling film I found. I mean, that whole sort of and clever film, sort of mixing up time, back and forth, constant transitions, constant mood changes. I, I love, I loved it, all of it. Um, and I found, like you say, whole sections of it incredibly moving. And sort of, I mean, I loved the Charge of the Light Brigade scene. I just thought that was outstanding. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then there was sequence after sequence like that coming. And I was just trying to catch my breath on lots of them. When you say, where do you put the, the year where it all goes wrong? I just thought, blimey, when we got to that, it was another sort of bravura <laughs> sequence. So I, I just thought you all did a brilliant job. But Joanna, I mean, it's an, it's an amazing piece of work. That's what I think. I just, and, and thank you for, um, for sharing all those details. <laughs> um it's, it was Thank great you. well sean i know you've done loads of films for arena as well and uh yeah. i felt like it was very much the kind of natural um pathway that we as editors have been led to from from arena um, definitely definitely uh, all, all that choice of music i loved heaven uh, heaven i'm in heaven Heavy as the crown, all, and all that mix of music. One minute it's classical music, the next minute it's sort of pop songs. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I just think when Kevin, you were saying, you know, what's, the, what was it supposed to be? Uh, you know, that it, it really is a sort of mix of our times. Um, I mean, that that's what it, that's what it, that's what that the film is. I mean, it, it succeeds brilliantly in those aims. I think. Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the antecedents for it probably you know, probably forgotten now mostly, but around there, when I was at the, when I was working in features at the BBC back in the early eighties, there was this series that John Burroughs did called the rock and roll years, which just used to take a year. And it was a BBC two kind of, I think they were half hours and they were an account of that year. And they just used the pop music of that year and occasionally a bit of sync from the archive. 
And I mean, I haven't watched any of them again since, but you know, that was always um, people who worked on that show. I remember down the corridor for me and network features used to really, really have a great time with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's why we weren't scared. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, just like to say thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much uh, to uh, Kevin for leading the leading the evening, and Joanna. It's a, a pleasure to meet you, and then uh, Emily, Rebecca, and Stuart. Congratulations, all of you, and thank thanks you. everyone else who has joined us. And um, we look forward to we look forward to thank you. It's you still doing. available on Amazon Prime. You know, you can watch it as no bitchery now. <laughs> yes.